Okay. 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 I will start. Okay. Hi, everybody. On behalf of the Easter Speech Process Special Interest Group Board, it's an honor for me to launch the Speech Process Lecture Series, welcoming Professor E. Xu from the University of College London. Professor Xu got his PhD from the University of Connecticut in 1993. Now he's Professor of Speech, Hearing, and Phonetic Sciences at the University of College London. Professor Xu will honor us with this inaugural lecture entitled Tackling Prosodic Phenomena at Their Roots. Professor Xu, thank you so much. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Pilinio. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity uh, to start this lecture series. Uh, let me first start, share my screen. And you can all We'll see my screen, right? So the uh, title of my talk, as Paninio mentioned, is Tackling Prosodic Phenomena at Their Roots. So the central question of this lecture is, is speech prosody a self-coherent whole? Uh, that is, uh, is it made of parts that work together to create a unified entity, for example, a hierarchical prosodic structure or a finite intonation grammar. Like this one shown here, as summarized by Gherkin and McGregor in 1998. So this is a nicely uh, or neatly uh, put together structure from utterance level, intonational phrase level, phonological phrase level, prosodic word level, foot level, syllable level. And this is for the metrical structure. Or as today's focus is mainly on the melodic part, that is the uh, intonation part. And as you can see here on the left is the traditional nuclear tone analysis from the UK. Um, in this system, an intonation is described as having an obligatory nuclear tone as shown here, and also optional head and tail. Um, so it, it itself is a coherent system. Or the most dominant theory nowadays is known as the AM theory or Pierre Humbert model, because Janet Pierre Humbert did her, her dissertation uh, developing this model. And this is known as a finite intonational grammar. What it shows is that in this system, um, these are the fixed or closed options of nuclear accents. And after that, you can have optional phrase tone. And in the early times, it's also called boundary tone. But now it's more known as phrase tone. And at the end of an intonation of phrase, you can also have a boundary tone. So all of these systems try to describe an intonation pattern as a coherent whole. Now, once we look at this, we realize that based on their, on their assumption, there are implications of this holistic view. That is, it assumes that each temporal location can only hold one linguistic unit of intonation. And each surface form, for example, or peak, valley, or shape, can only have a single linguistic representation. And also, each linguistic representation must correspond to a readily observable form. Now, these observations lead us to a question. That is, we know there are more than one thing going on at the same time with F0 contours. So for example, we know if the language is tonal, you have lexical tone, which is mainly using F0 to represent itself. And also, as you will see later, lexical stress, which also 
uses F0 very seriously. And also prosodic focus and modality, which refers to contrast between statements and questions, and potentially new topic and turn taking. All these have been researched by uh, various researchers. And on top of that, you may have emotional meanings, which involves a lot of uh, pitch variabilities. So suddenly we have a question, how can this be uh, all represented by uh, international contour? So as an example, I start with Mandarin. Uh, Mandarin is a tone language, uh, which has four lexical tones, or it could have a fifth one, which is the neutral tone. And in this example, we have a sentence with five syllables, and they happen to have all high tones. So when you hear the sentence without prosodic focus, it sounds like this. Mommy, more mommy. But Mandarin is such that it can also have prosodic focus. It has a very robust means of um, carrying or conveying prosodic focus. Like this one, if you have a focus on the initial disyllabic word. Mommy, mommy. What you can see here is that the pitch range of the focus word is raised. But on top of that, the pitch after the, post, the focused word is lowered. And this uh, later is known as post-focus compression, which turns out to be a major uh, cue for, for prosodic focus. And then if you emphasize the middle word, which is a verb in a sentence, mommy, more mommy. Uh, you can see that Again, the pitch is raised on the focus word and the pitch after the word is lowered, just like in the early focus. But what's also interesting is that before that, the pitch doesn't change much. So in other words, introducing focus on this word doesn't change pitch much before it. And then when you have a final focus, which is the dash line here, mommy, mommy. you can hear that it's different from neutral focus, but it's not that obvious. So in other words, this is conveyed, but not as robustly as early focus. But the key point here is to show that for Mandarin, where you are sure that every syllable has a pitch specification for distinguishing between words, it can also have focus and focus is also represented very robustly. And according to perception experiments, listeners can easily detect the location of focus. The same thing happens to English as well. So uh, although from the Tobii system or the AM theory or Pierre Humbert model, this is often not clearly represented. So this is directly from Pierre Humbert's dissertation, where for this sentence, Anna came with Manny, uh, the system only recognized a pitch accent here and a phrase accent here and a boundary tone here, meaning that there are no meaningful, significant phonological events going on in between. And here's an example from the Toby tutorial page. Anna married Lenny. But for those of us who know English, we know that these words have lexical stress. So Anna has initial stress and Mary has the initial stress and Lenny has the initial stress. So the question is, um, do, does the stress have anything to do with pitch? So one clue is from this study by Rump and Collier in 1996. In this, study, they studied the intonation of Dutch, which is very similar to English. And they manipulated the pitch height of two words in a sentence, uh, Amanda went to Malta. So they manipulate the height of the two keywords. And these are the four prototypical patterns that listeners heard as 
the four focus types, which are neutral focus, single late focus, single early focus, and double focus. What I'm focusing on this on is this one, where you have single early focus, which is heard by listeners as the most representative of single early focus when it has a high peak on Amanda, but a little bump left on Malta. So the question is, what is this little bump about? Which is even smaller than the one uh, er before focus. It turns out that this little bump is little bump is very meaningful because according to a study done by D.B. Fry in 1958, the little bump is enough to represent lexical stress in English. Fry's study is a perception study. Again, he manipulated the relative pitch of two syllables in words like subject, subject, object, object. So as you can recognize that these words can be either noun or verbs, depending on where the stress is. The prochaic version that is stressed on the first syllable is a noun, whereas the stress on the second syllable is a verb. What he showed, what he manipulated is F0 duration and intensity. And it turns out that all of these acoustic dimensions are relevant for stress perception. But what the most amazing is that duration and intensity, although they convey lexical stress, their effects on the perception is gradient. Whereas their effects, the effects of F0 on perception is highly categorical, meaning that as soon as you have a five hertz difference between the two adjacent syllables, you hear it either as a noun or a verb. And most interesting is that when you increase the difference between the syllables, the perception of whether it's a verb or a noun doesn't improve. So it stays the same, meaning that all you need is the five hertz. And five hertz is roughly equal to less than one semitone less than one semitone. And linking that to a study we did in 2005, where we studied the focus uh, behavior in English, we also identified that underneath the focus, you also have small ripples along the intonation line. And the size of these ripples are less than one semitone on average. So in other words, uh, there's always small ripples beneath the large movements of focus, which means that both for Mandarin and in English, each location can represent at least two functions. One is lexical and the other one is focal. Then we look further to see if there's possibility of uh, adding a further function. And indeed, I'll start with Mandarin again, where you can have tone and you can then have focus. And then on top of that, you can also indicate whether you are asking a question or making a statement. So I'll start with this sentence. And you, you probably hear a almost flat pitch across the whole utterance. That's because the whole utterance consists of only high tone words. Uh, the sentence means that a person named Zhang Wei is concerned that a person named Xiao Ying may get dizzy when driving. So this is a long sentence. And uh, so this is all high tone. And this one is all rising tone for every syllable, every monosyllabic word. So this is how it sounds. So now you're sure that the sentence can be either high tone 
or rising tone. But on top of that, you can have focus. So when you have an early focus, like this one. So although the tones remain still all high tone, she managed to put focus on the first word. And the same is true here. Okay. Now, if we want to turn it into questions, you can do that starting from the neutral focus condition. So corresponding to this uh, contour, you have the questions uh, intonation. And this one. And also we can add focus on top of that to indicate both the question intonation and focus intonation, like this one. Wrong one. This one. And we're sure that listeners can hear uh, all three functions clearly because we did perception experiment. Uh, and that shows that for both focus and question intonation, listeners can hear them clearly. Now on to English. So in English, again, we see the same thing that you can encode both focus and lexical stress and question intonation, mainly with F0 contours. So in this study published in 2007, uh, we looked at sentences that are either having a medial focus or final focus. We didn't have neutral focus. So with medial fo with final focus, it would sound like this. There's something unmarriable about me. You can clearly hear the emphasis on the last word. And with medial focus. There's something unmarriable about me. You can hear that unmarriable is emphasized. What's more interesting is that you can turn them into question, still maintaining the focus location. So this is. There's something unmarriable about me. So you can hear final focus, but now it's a question. Again, if you if you ask the if you have the focus on the medial word, and turn that into a question, it will sound like this. There's something unmarriable about me. This corresponds to the red line. And this is very, uh, very peculiar because it is a prototypical pattern in American English for indicating focus. What happens is that the whole pitch range is raised, starting from the focus word. But there's something else that happens in English as well. That is, once you turn a sentence from a statement to a question, the underlying pitch target for the stress syllable also changes. It flips from a high pitch to a low pitch. So listen to the statement. You're going to Bloomingdale's with Elaine. And then question. You're going to Bloomingdale's with Elaine? With a red line. And of course, after that, pitch range is raised. So in other words, English does something more to uh, encode question intonation than Mandarin, probably because it has a little more freedom to do that. Now, so having seen these examples, uh, we can, we can uh, describe some lessons. So if lexical stress, lexical tone, focus, and modality, modality here refers to the statement and statement and question contrast, are proper linguistic functions. It is then hard to maintain that any particular F0 shape by itself is a legitimate phonological unit because it is uh, rather all surface F0 forms are amalgamates of multiple communicative functions. That is, that can include both linguistic and even paralinguistic functions. Given that, we can now ask further, but how are F0 contours jointly shaped 
by multiple functions. For this, we need to look at another set of root causes, which is on the other side of the prosody myth, because you both have communicative functions and you also have articulatory mechanisms. Again, we start from Mandarin. Again, we start from the sentence with all high stress, all high tone. Mommy, more mommy. Uh, this is me uh, as a speaker. Now, this is very easy to understand, right? So it's flat because all of them have high tone. But what if I change one tone in the sentence, like this one, changing it from high tone to a low tone? And it will sound like this. Mommy, more mommy. So you can hear that the second syllable has become a low tone. But what, what the auditory uh, sensation cannot tell us is what exactly did the speaker do to make it a low tone? Um, in the, before we have data and uh, when we can only imagine things, we may think that something like this happens because this is a low tone. So I make a sharp shift to a low tone and then after it, after it, make a sharp shift back to a high tone, right? Of course, given that we probably know that it's impossible, maybe we cannot make a transition that fast. So it may have some transitional period at both boundaries. But what's surprising first for me, when I first uh, uh, look at the data, when I was still doing my PhD, is this is what happens. There is no reserved transition period, except that the transition itself happens during the tone production itself. So the transition toward the low target happens during the low tone syllable. And the transition back to the high tone happens during the high tone syllable. Now, then we ask the question, why does the tone movement take so long? We know there may be inertia, but why would the inertia be so big? By now, we actually have an answer to this question. And this is a study we did when published in 2002, where we, we asked people to change pitch as quickly as possible by saying, mala, mala, mala or ah, 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 and then we measured how fast they can change pitch under pressure. And uh, these three plots are plot of slope and peak velocity and, and the uh, excursion size. Although this one is the least linear, but you can still derive some rough equations based on this. Um, and these are the equations from the excursion size as a function uh, or the excursion size or the uh, mm, excursion time as a function of ex excursion size. So given a particular excursion size, how much time do you need to make the transition? And the excursion size is represented in the equation by D and the uh, uh, and the function gives you a rough estimate of how much time you would need to make that transition. So from these equations, you can already see something. That is, given that you make this d zero, this term, the constant term, remains. And in both cases, for pitch rise and pitch falls, the constant term is roughly 100 millisecond long meaning that you need at least 100 milliseconds to make any pitch change, even if it's the smallest possible. Now, if we apply this equation to some real life cases, and these data from my 1997 study, where you can see that after low tone, to produce the high tone, the high tone has to move from the end of the low tone to its own target height, and which is 
about six semitones long, six semitones big, the difference. And if we plug in the six into the equation, you get 142 milliseconds, which means that for this duration of 196 milliseconds, most of this duration needs to be used for the transitions. And of course, because it didn't use up all the time, you can see, you can say that there is still some leeway. But there are other situations where you don't even have that. That is for the falling tones in Mandarin, it turns out that you have to make two movements. The first to reach a particular height, and then the second to go down for the fall proper. And for the duration calculation, you need to add the two together. So four semitone plus six semitone for each time. And from the equation itself, you get 265 milliseconds, which is even longer than the actual syllable duration. And the only way, the only way for it to work is that when we calculated maximum speed, we use the minimal pitch, which is here, and, and also minimal pitch here, and which is longer than the syllable itself. So in other words, speakers have to use almost the fastest speed possible to make a dynamic tone like a falling tone. And that's indeed the case as confirmed by the study itself when we are compared the voluntary pitch change data with just natural speech data. It turns out that if the, in a natural speech, you have dynamic tone that is rising, falling, the speed of pitch change is about the same as the fastest speed we could get from uh, this study. Whereas for the static tones, speakers do have some leeway so that they can afford to be a bit lazy. And there's another study for further confirmation uh, where we find that if you have an utterance like ling, 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 and this is the slow speed, and this is the normal speed, ling, 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 and this is fast speed. At the fast speed, the demand is so high that speakers can only flatten their pitch. But what's the most interesting is that the normal speech rate and fast speech rate both reach the fastest speed possible. So again, it's further confirmation that in normal speech, we often reach our highest speed uh, of pitch change. Okay, now we are looking at one more missing piece. Given that articulatory gestures take time due to inertia, and many gestures are given barely enough time to complete. Why don't speakers adjust the temporal alignment of gestures to give at least some of them sufficient time? So we're assuming that we're able to move things around. But it turns out that we may not have that ability due to a hypothetical articulatory synchrony. That is, um, this is a hypothesis that was proposed almost simultaneously um, by two groups. One is by the group uh, working on, into, on artificial phonology. So this is Goldstein, Bert, uh, and uh, Saltzman, 2006. And also Xu and Liu, 2006. And we, the proposals were based on very different uh, reasons. What's interesting is that the artificial phonology backed off this hypothesis, at least temporarily. Because according to Tilson, they have revised the uh, hypothesis by saying that um, the vowel gestures starts between the onset and release of consonant gesture. And the reason for the change is that they could not find evidence for the synchrony, despite the nice hypothesis. And also, more directly related to our current concern, uh, Mangao, in the 2009 paper, reports her results uh, that 
tone gesture even lag behind consonant vowel in Mandarin. So what we did later on is to use a different method. So we come up with a method based on minimal contrast paradigm. That is, it defines the gesture onset, not as what they did because they use the velocity threshold to define the onset of a single gesture. We always use two contrasting gestures to define their common onset time. That is, if you put them together, you observe their dividing point, divergent point, and then you use that to determine their onsets, like this one here. Here I'm showing you Foreman data. So this is F2, but we have two pairs. One is the consonantal pair between L and Y. And the other one is a vowel pair between E and U. But because they, they share one consonant, L here, so we can also call it a tri minimal triplet. This allows us to compare, to both determine the onset of the consonant and the onset of the vowel, and also compare the consonant onset time and the vowel consonant time. As you can see, so the blue line versus the black line here gives you the contrast between Y and L. And this is where they roughly start. And the dark line versus the red line gives you the starting time for the vowel contrast between E and U. And this is their common starting point. As you can see from the graph here, they start roughly at the same time, meaning that in Mandarin, consonants and vowels start roughly at the same time. After this study, we recently did a series of studies uh, to further verify the data. And the first one is published in 2022 by Liu and the others. Um, we used evidence based on GAMS analysis and uh, uh, MMM's analysis, and also Bayesian analysis. And in the 2021, uh, this is for confirmation for Mandarin. And in 2021 study, we looked at English and we showed that in an English word initial cluster, syllable initial consonant cluster, the vowel onset starts with the onset of the very first consonant, not in the middle, not as in the C sensor hypothesis says, but from the very first consonant. And in a study published this year, we showed that in English, when you re a consonant like uh, an apple, the N has become re to become the onset consonant of the next syllable. And in that case, the that N has been synchronized to the next syllable rather than the previous syllable. And lately, this is one is not, not published because this is a master dis dissertation. Uh, in this study, she showed that when you use the same method to look at tones, and we are even more certain tones are also synchronized with consonant and vowel at the beginning of the syllable. And this leads us back to a model that we proposed some time ago, so at first 2006, and then with an extended form, uh, 2020. This model says that the syllable, the nature of the syllable is to synchronize consonant, vowel, tone, and potentially phonation register as well, if the language uses it uh, lexically. So in that case, at the beginning of the syllable, the initial consonant, the vowel, and the tone, and the phonation register all start at the same time. But if you have a coda consonant, it has to be sequentially aligned to uh, the nuclear vowel. And this actually for each component 
every one of them is a target approximation movement as described here, although this model was proposed long ago, but now we, we put them together, we can see uh, the logic more clearly. So this model proposes that for each syllable, you have to have a linear target, which is the underlying target. And then to produce it, you start from where you have to start because of the previous tone or because of the onset of the utterance. And then you move from that point to approach the underlying target. If you have enough time, you can reach it. If you don't, you just end wherever you are. And then you have to move on to the next one. But in the actual production, you cannot make a sharp turn. So this is what you will get on surface, meaning that when you see this surface, it the peak itself is not really the end. It's because of the delay uh, of inertia. And this model um, is implemented as QTA, um, so which has a demo program. Uh, I encourage you to go to the website and play with it. So I'll show you here. Right, this is the one. Uh, this one show allows you to manipulate either the categorical tone. For example, if you change it to fall to rise, and you get this one, you change its tone. And you can also change the tone parameters or the target parameters of these. So if you want your high tone to be higher, you can change the height from 210 to 230, and you'll get this. So in other words, this model assumes that you can have both tone categories and you can change the actual parameters of any particular tone. And you can also show the effect of strength, duration, and so on. So uh, do play with it because I, I often go back to this to test a lot of uh, hypotheses I uh, propose. And this leads us to a more complete model uh, of intonation. But this one, I wouldn't call it a coherent structure. It's just a, just a cover model to indicate how you can convey multiple functions through even just an F0 dimension itself. So in this model, these are the independent dimensions, independent functions, communicative functions that speakers want to convey. And for each one of them, they do it through a so-called encoding scheme. What is critical is that these encoding schemes are specified in terms of articulatory targets, like target height, target slope, and target strength. And these three are actually three parameters of the QTA model. So with the QTA model for each target, you need to have values for each one of them. And once you have these values, it can be implemented by the target approximation model itself. So one thing we do share with the AM theory and nuclear tone analysis is that at the articulation level, we assume everything is linear meaning that for every location, you can have only a single articulatory target for pitch. And if for vowel, you can have a single articulatory target for, for the vowel. So in this model, multiple communicative functions are encoded in parallel by jointly specifying parameters of syllable size pitch targets. In other words, all of them incur influences, exert influences on these parameters. And that's how these parameters got its value. But once they got their values, you only, you are left with a sequence of them. Yeah. Now, with this notion, we, we can make it, we can make it feasible. That is, you can actually implement it in a model. And that's what we did when developing 
Panda Trainer. So Panda Trainer, which is also available uh, here. Um, with this tool, we actually implemented the idea how you can have multiple functional uh, local targets. So in other words, in this case, we have three functions. One is a lexical function, stress, and the other one is focus, and the third one is question. So you can hear the sentence. You're going to Bloomingdale's with Alan? So you can hear the emphasis here, and you can hear it's a question. So F0 keeps raising toward the end. But even with these three levels, the assumption is that all of them contribute to this monosyllabic underlying pitch targets. The next question is, how do you learn these targets? And that becomes a modeling issue. That is, you, once you have Penta Trainer, then you can learn these targets through stochastic learning, through stochastic or statistical optimization. And they learn these targets from functionally annotated data. So the uh, we do have to annotate data. Otherwise, you wouldn't know what the functions are. So here's one result. Um, this is the original, the one you just heard. You're going to Bloomingdale's with Alan? And this is synthetic based on learned targets. You're going to Bloomingdale's with Alan? So it's not identical and it's not perfect because this result is from a very small corpus uh, done for only for, for this presentation. But still you can know, you can see that it works. Now we turn into an even further issue. That is, now that we have a model like this, we can treat it as something that simulates vocal learning. The ability of Panda Trainer to achieve end-to-end -end modeling of tone and intonation means that it could also inform us about how multifunctional pitch targets can be learned in speech acquisition. But the model of learning, it simulates, if you think about it, is trial and error via direct mimicry. That is, every time it compares the synthetic one with the actual one to see how well the two match. It may sound right, reasonable, but there's a problem. In reality, a child cannot play the adult utterance over and over again and every time imitate the recording. They can't do that. So in fact, during the modeling process, uh, we were forced to think of alternatives. And one alternative that came up is perceptual guided training. And this at first was developed during the modeling of learning of consonants vowels, but we now have implemented the method to uh, tone as well. So in this study that I supervised last year, um, we compared three training methods. The first one is closeness of fit, which simulates direct imitation. And the second one is recognition of synthetic F0 by trained tone recognizers. So in other words, we use the corpus first to train a recognizer, a standard recognizer. And then we use that to simulate the perception of the learner, assuming the perception the, perception the learner develops first. And then we have a third condition where the perceptual guidance is added some, some additional boost. And these are the results. It turns out that the best results were obtained by the original. So we compare our data with the perception of the original tone. It, it is uh, at 81%. But the second best is the enhanced recognition condition, which is almost as good as perception. So in other words, this perceptual guided learning has overpassed the F0 fitting, which is implemented in the standard, the current version of Panda Train. And this is really a surprise. 
So what this means is that the most effective tone learning strategy may therefore be perception guided vocal practice, provided there is a mechanism to limit the learner's exploration range, which could be just a technical issue. Okay, so we're near the end. So I'll just mention a few other things I don't have time to cover, but these all point to very different root causes. So for the, for the focus uh, pattern, in fact, we hypothesize it has a single origin. And the origin is in the Middle East about 13,000 years ago. So the series of studies uh, to look into that. And the good news is that so far, there's no, no rebuttal of the hypothesis by data. So, so far it's still standing. And the second one is that for emotions, there's a whole set of mechanisms totally independent of what we know before. And that is still ongoing study. And also for the maximum rate of intonation, and maximum rate of uh, pitch change has been applied to maximum rate of tongue and, and the lips and, and so on. So we'll find the same thing, which led us to propose that this is a fundamental principle of motor control, which is different from the standard economy of effort hypothesis. And also we did the recent survey study, the more theoretical proposal. We proposed that tone changes historically can be explained by the target approximation model, assuming that during speech, a lot of tones are undershot, and that has led to misperception, which led to tone changes. And finally, we did a study that looked at the compressibility of syllable duration, and the results showed that it's impossible for English to be stress time, as everybody thinks it, it is, because there is no room for English segments to be compressed. But surprisingly for Mandarin, there is actually room to be both syllable time and uh, phrase time, but it's just a tendency toward those. Okay, so finally, in conclusion, beneath seemingly coherent historical, uh, uh, coherent holistic intonation patterns are diverse root causes in terms of both communicative functions and articulatory mechanisms. And these root causes are often independent of each other and typically not immediately obvious. So this means is that they're hard to discover through inductive means, that is just making observations and making summaries, but need research devoted to finding underlying mechanisms through hypothesis testing. And one of the ultimate means of hypothesis testing is end-to-end -end computational modeling. Basically, what we are seeing here is that a theory is inadequate if it cannot be computationally implemented. So in other words, we're not just doing modeling for modeling's sake, but using models to actually represent theory and because it's a model, and especially because it's end-to-end, -end, the results of the modeling can be tested vigorously. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, E. Now we have time for questions. I asked you some time for <laughs> waiting for the questions. Be a carpet on the, the room. Start, please, if you have questions. In the chat room. Uh, so far, no question, but uh, from Om um, said that thank you. Oh, I, I will copy here from from <laughs> YouTube to chat. <laughs> A minute, please. Okay. From uh, that, th this message is from uh, is by from from Om. Sorry for my pronunciation. 
Thank you for a great talk. Perceptual guided learning is very interesting. Similar concept, concept is used often in training the AI model via reinforcement learning. A comment. Yes, thank you. Oh, hi, Sam. Nice to see you here. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you for, for mentioning that. I didn't realize that AI model, but what you're saying here is that they're in principle similar to each other, right? Because the uh, the AI models, uh, at least if we are thinking about large language models, they work on the text level uh, rather than on the uh, signal level. Uh, so, in fact, if you have something, I would love to hear about it. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Thanks for this. I wonder how you... Yeah, I, I can read the question. I wonder how you... Since, uh, Synchronization model of the syllable shed light on finding the minimal planning unit being syllable in Mandarin, but being statement in languages like English. Okay. Um, first, I'm not sure what you stated here is the actual case. Uh, I'm not saying it is not. I, I, I can only say I don't know which is the, the planning unit. In fact, this is one of the things we are actually trying to, to look at. Um, my thinking is that because this is a very wrong fundamental issue, it's unlikely to be very different across languages. And usually the, the differences are more specific because, for example, we already know that in English, when you have a coda consonant followed by a syllable that starts with a vowel, the coda consonant would become the onset of the next syllable. So in that case, we call it to be resyllabified. Like the example I used, uh, an apple. You would say, uh, like a native speaker would say, an apple, right? But if you're a Mandarin speaker, you would say an apple. So in Mandarin, the coda consonant, when it's followed by a syllable starting with a vowel, is dropped. So a famous example would be, Tian an men, you would say Tianmen, you wouldn't say Tianmen, right? Whereas an English speaker would say Tianmen for the uh, uh, heaven and peace uh, gate. Okay, thank you. May I make a question too? <laughs> of course. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we, in our talk, you explained that in English, Besides focus, F0 contour simultaneously encode uh, word stress as well, right? So yes. uh, we expect to observe F, like functional F0 patterns in the syllables that are stressed and focused. But what about uh, unstressed syllables in English? Is there something that they encode in English? Or the F0 contour in unstressed syllable are just at like transitions between, uh, like a, an interpolation between the stressed ones? Uh, in fact, uh, our understanding is that there's no such thing that is only for the sake of transition. In fact, what happens in English, you can kind of already see uh, in the data, uh, although I didn't say anything about that. Let me find the, the right graph. So in this case, what I mentioned is what happens to the stress syllable. So stress syllable, when it changes from a statement to a question, it changes from high to low. But in both cases, the unstressed syllable remains largely in the middle. And also in a question intonation, it goes higher. So in other words, in our understanding, every syllable, including those uh, unstressed in English and also in Mandarin when it carries the neutral tone. They both have their targets. The only difference is that their targets are weaker. In other words, their strength parameter has lower value 
than the other syllables. And then that is actually one of its major characteristics, articular characteristics. So once you define the unstressed syllable and the neutral tone that way, you don't have to, to have a separate mechanism to describe their behavior. The only thing is that, because we, know, we have already shown that with Panda Trainer, you can learn the weak strength automatically. You don't, you don't even need to know ahead of time. All oh, right, and and these mechanisms uh, also applies to like Romance language and Brazilian Portuguese, for example. <laughs> I would say these principles are universal, but in each case, I'm not sure. For example, I heard that the stress in Spanish is different from English. Uh, in that case, so for any particular language, you have to look at the data. And uh, with Panda Trainer, you can actually annotate the data and train it and see what you get from the target values. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have another question here. Um, actually, two questions for the first one. Yeah. Yes. It's this one. By Vanessa. Uh, hello, thank you for the extremely and uh, insightful talk. I'm wondering, in Penta, for the four parameters, actually, actually I, have, I would say the fourth parameter is not actually the target parameter itself. It's imposed onto the target itself. Uh, it's the only one that which is un under uh, our control. Yes, yes, you are right. You are yes. You definitely said it right. So that one is not under our control. It's under control of other functions that directly uh, manipulate the duration. And then actually, there are things like stress. So English stress has a lot to do with the duration. A Mandarin neutral tone has a lot to do with the duration as well. And also boundary marking, which I didn't have time to cover has a lot to do with duration as well. So in other words, the duration itself, uh, the duration requirement can be imposed by different functions and also speech rate can change it too. So it's a it's a factor that is imposed on top of the target approximation mechanism. Um, did you say there's another question? Yes, by Nigel Ward. Oh, okay. Uh, Nigel, uh, speech policy research circuit. Oh, no, that's the, oh, yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, a minor point on slide 13, 14, you mentioned that the F0 targets for focus can flip from high to low in contours of a question. Have you worked out the details? <laughs> yes, yes, we did, we did. Because once you apply Panda Trainer, you get new values. Um, so let's let's go there. So these are analysis data, but if we go to uh, the modeling one, after this. I should have gone straight to it. Yeah, this one uh, is applied based on the learned targets. So can we identify some uh, unstressed syllables? This is the original. You're going to Bloomingdale's with Alan? This is Bloomingdale's. So these are all unstressed syllables. So these learned the same targets although it took some time for them to approach that target. So once you have these target values, they have parameters and those parameters can be analyzed. And th in fact, this is how we discovered that all the unstressable in English have lower uh, lambda value, which is um, the equivalent of tau in, in a different version of uh, the spring mass model. So we can learn all the details with the panda trainer. In fact, this is one of the things that we are we're seeing that is unlike the thinking in 
phonology where you have to give a particular transcription a value. In our case, as long as you recognize the category you, by an annotating them, you don't need to know the value ahead of time. These are in the model parameters. And every parameter would have its value, but the values are from data. They are empirical. And this would allow you to actually look at dialectical differences and subtle language differences because you don't need to force yourself to say whether this is high or low. Uh, I'm not sure. May, I, this... mm -hmm. May I, <laughs> I have a quick yes, question yes, about this ahead. slide? Why are you using a full uh, underlying um, target in this same um, simulation of the of this of this sentence? At the end, you are using a falling. You... At the end of this of this simulation, you are. I I I think you are using a falling target for the end of the utterance. Is that right? That's a very good question. Why? This is something. <laughs> That needs to bother me. So my answer is that I don't care anymore. <laughs> okay, first of all, when you say why, I, I, I say the, the model after training learned it that way. I didn't tell it to do it. So when we first came out the model, we used to think that if we assume, for example, the Mandarin high tone should have a zero slope value. So in fact, in our very first study, we enforced that. But later on, we realized that, why do we have to do that? And wow. probably learners don't even need to do that too, because all they need to learn is the gradient parameters. So in other words, when you apply the model, when you apply the trainer, you just, you may get different values, even every time you run it. But in the end, it's what, it, the quality of the synthesis that can tell you whether you have done a good job or not. And if it's not good enough, you, you have to come up with some modifications. But in general, it's the, the these data are empirical rather than imposed by humans onto it. So a lot of cases, I'm not happy with the value learned because even for rising tone, you may learn some cases, a falling one, but the it can generate a surface contour that seems to be very close to the natural one. Okay. Okay, thank you. Do you have another quick question? Because it's over at 2 p.m. here. No. In, no? in YouTube chat, there, there is no other, no other question. Okay, but we are already at 2 p.m. I would like again to uh, thank you, Shu, for being here inauguration this series of lectures in, on speech prosody. And I would like to say to the public that the next one will be on the 16th of November by the, at the same time. And it will be uh, done by Malin Svensson Lundmark from Sweden. And I also, also would like to thank all the public that listened to us during your lecture. E. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Polinio. Thank you everybody for listening. I hope the theories be a great success. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Gustavo. Thank you, all hey, the people. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.